done. This morning, that's really the focus of the message that I have for us. We're going to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you would turn there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to see today uh, a truth that not only we can reflect on, remembering what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us, but also how that impacts us in the midst of a pandemic, how it impacts us just in our everyday life and what our life is all about. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 are some familiar verses. We're going to read through these two together, beginning in verse number 19. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This is wonderful truths. Verse number 19, that the Holy Spirit is within us, that we are indwelt by Him. And, and here the Apostle Paul, he's teaching the entire church, the entire Corinthian church, that they all, as believers, have the Holy Spirit in them. And this is in the context of people who are in the midst of some gross, immoral sin. And yet still, he tells them the Holy Spirit's in you. What this teaches us is that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit the moment that we are saved, and He will never leave us. Just as we read elsewhere in the Word of God, that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. He'll never leave us. Wonderful truths that we could look at in verse number 19, but that's not my emphasis this morning. Rather, it is the phrase in verse 20. And it's this phrase, ye are bought with a price. Ye are bought with a price. And we're going to consider those thoughts together today. Let's start with prayer. Lord, I pray right now that you would help us. Lord, wherever we're at, Lord, whether this is someone watching live, someone coming and, and hearing your word later, Father, whether we're in this auditorium, as just a handful have assembled here, or Lord, in our living room, bedroom, wherever it may be, Lord, we know that you are not limited, that you are everywhere, and Father, that you're with us. Even as we read in these words, the Holy Spirit is within every child of God. And so, Lord, I pray right now that Holy Spirit within would work in our hearts. Take your truth, apply it. Lord, wherever we're at, that you would move us today. Lord, give us the grace to really set apart this time, to really think of the price that was given for us to buy us out of the slavery to sin. Father, I pray that you would help us today to, to be moved by these truths, that we would glorify you in our body, in our spirit, which are yours. Lord, all these things receive glory. Help us through these times. Help us in these times, in these moments, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing I'd have us to note in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is emphasizing in verse 20 that simple two-letter pronoun, ye. Ye. He's talking to the church. Ye are bought with a price. And I'd like for us to look, first of all, at the people. Thinking about who was bought. The first thing that we could say about these people is that they were, like you and I, ultimately nothing but dust. We read in the word of God, from dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. As the psalmist asks of the Lord in, psalm, uh, in, the, in the book of Psalms, what is man that the Lord is mindful of him? In light of all of the universe, how small we are, how insignificant each and every one of us. And yet we're part of the ye. Not only were these individuals but dust, as created by God, also these individuals like you and I are defiled, defiled by sin. The Lord Jesus Christ declared, there is none good but one, and that is God. The book of Ecclesiastes says, there is not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. One of the chapters that is most detailing just how far sin defiles us is Isaiah 59, where he takes the time in that in that chapter to look at how our hands, our fingers, our lips, 
our tongue, our mind, our feet, totally defiled by sin. Now, we are given, in the day in which we live, uh, a wonderful picture of the defilement by sin. And that is because of the pandemic that's going on. Here recently, I went out and we got some pizza from Little Caesars, and I went in and I had a, a code on my phone. I was trying to get this thing to scan it so I didn't have to touch anything. Unfortunately, the thing wouldn't scan, and I had to reach out and punch the code, and I looked at my finger. Now my finger's defiled because somebody else's finger had touched that. As we think about the way this virus spreads, and somebody who has it, anything they touch is now filthy. We wouldn't shake their hand. We wouldn't touch their feet. We wouldn't want to abide in their presence because they're defiled by this virus. You know what? So it is with us and sin. Everything that man touches becomes defiled. And that's why we read in Isaiah 64 that even our righteousnesses are filthy rags. Because in the eyes of God, it is defiled by that virus that we call sin. But you know, there's something more in verse number 20 when it says, Ye are bought with a price, and it's in the phrase bought. Ye are bought. So this group, this ye, is dust. And they are defiled by sin, but also that word tells us that that ye were slaves. Ye were slaves. The word bought is the Greek word agorazo. The Greek agora was the marketplace, and the thought is that these are ones who were bought out of the marketplace. The picture is individuals who were slaves. Yes, that's what the Bible teaches us. That all of us, apart from Jesus Christ, are slaves. And not just slaves in general, but slaves to sin. The spiritual condition of every human who has ever lived at one time or another is that they were servants or slaves to sin. That's what it says in Romans 6, 17. Ye were the servants of sin. You have to understand in the King James Version, the word servant comes from the Greek word doulos, which could also be translated slave. Here's the Greek dictionary on that word servant. It is a word that is defined as one who is in a permanent relation of servitude to another, his will being altogether consumed in the will of the other. That is one who is a servant or a slave to sin. Turn with me to John chapter 8 for just a moment. Look in John chapter 8. Jesus Christ spoke about this. In fact, he made the exact same statement that all who are sinners are slaves to sin. Notice what he says in John 8 and verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I'm giving you a deep spiritual truth right here. I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. It's in this context where the Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 36, those words with which we're very familiar, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And so we grasp now a little bit of a picture of what it means to be freed. It means we've been set at liberty from the slavery to sin. This is the truth reiterated time and again throughout the pages of Scripture. You and I, without the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, are slaves to sin. We cannot free ourselves from its power. We cannot free ourselves from its presence. We cannot free ourselves from its penalty. Now, one of the frightening things about the slavery to sin that mankind is in bondage to is that we're, we're prone to, de to deceive ourselves and to deny that we are slaves at all. We make ourselves believe that we can be liberated by our own efforts, by our own, by our own endeavors. We can liberate ourselves from sin's power and its presence and its penalty. One of the conversations that the Lord Jesus Christ had right here in John chapter 8 is one of those that just makes you scratch your head. Look at verse number 33, because this is telling about human nature. Look at what the Jews said in verse 33. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed... And were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Now here's the part of that that is almost laughable. These people making this claim 
have not only forgotten their history because the Jews were all taken captive to Babylon, but they were also forgetting they were currently under the rule of Rome. When Christ was crucified, as we remember this week, what did they have to do? They had to take Jesus before Pilate, the Roman governor. Why? Because only Rome could give permission for such an execution. These same people had to pay tribute. Remember, as the coin was brought to Jesus Christ, he said, let me see it. Whose picture is on this coin? They said, Caesar's. He says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? It's because the, the, the Joseph and Mary, being under that Roman domination, had to return to their, to, their native, uh, to their native city in order to be part of that census so, Romans would, so the Romans could tax them effectively. Their signs of their bondage were everywhere. And yet they said, we have never been in bondage. Isn't that funny? And yet, you know, it's the same thing with people all around us with lost men and women. You could ask a lost man today, are you a slave to sin? (laughs) He'd say, I'm no slave. I do what I please. Others would say, I can stop if I want to. Many believe they can transform themselves, can turn over a new leaf, can get religious. I love my neighbor. I I can pay my dues. I can do unto others. And, And by this, they think they've freed themselves. But you know what? They can't. That's the sad, unfortunate truth. It's not just what these Jews and their blindness, but it's the same thing of all those that are yet slaves to sin right now. They still abide under sin's power and authority. There must be a transfer of kingdoms, a change in their inner person. That's why Jesus said, ye must be born again, except the man is born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. They are yet part of the kingdom of darkness. They are slaves to sin. Still they abide not only sin's power, but under sin's presence. Paul the apostle declared, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. By the way, the ultimate freedom from sin's presence is not until one of two events for a Christian. It's either at death or at the rapture. Until then, even you and I yet deal with the presence of sin in our lives. Further, All who are not saved yet abide under sin's penalty, which is death, physical, spiritual, and eternal. Satan, the slave master, assures his slaves that they will not surely die, as he said in the Garden of Eden. There can't be a hell. There's nothing to fear. And yet we read the penalty will be meted out. As we saw last Sunday in Hebrews chapter 10, there is a certain a definite, fearful, looking for a fiery indignation to all those who have not been covered by the sacrifice of Christ. Oh, how awful it is for one to be a slave to sin. When we read the words, ye are bought with a price in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, understand the predicament of the ye had the price not been paid. Let's look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Understand the people that were bought Now, number two, let us consider the price by which they were purchased. These verses speak of that purchased people, but boy, what a price. The Bible term redemption, we sang redeemed, how we love to proclaim it. What does it mean to be redeemed? It means to buy back, to ransom from the bondage of sin. The word implies there would be a cost to the one who affected the liberation. There are three different Greek words which, which are translated redeemed in the New Testament. One of them is right here in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. Though the word redeemed is not used, it could be when it says ye are bought with a price, it could say ye are redeemed with a price. We're redeemed. And that's that word agarazzo, which means to go into the marketplace and to buy a slave. Not only that, there's a second word, and that is the Greek word ex agarazzo. The word that those two letters X being added on the end means out of. It means to buy a slave out of the slave market. And the third is lutrao, which means to set free. And so you put the three together and it gives us a picture of the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ, that he went into the slave market and he paid a price to redeem us. Then he brought us out of that slave market and he set us free. That's the redemption that is through Jesus Christ. And it's only by Jesus Christ that we can be set free from the slavery 
to sin. What was the price of our redemption? Well, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter number 1, we were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. This week, we'll take time to consider again what our Lord Jesus Christ suffered. Think back to the words of Psalm 22. And it's Psalm 22, it's amazing that in the Word of God, the place where you could go to understand the physical suffering the most and what Jesus went through on the cross, it's amazing to me that it's an Old Testament passage, a prophecy of what would transpire. Psalm 22, as it spoke prophetically of all he would endure, we read these words, that Jesus would be poured out like water. It would seem to be a reference to how freely Christ's blood flowed from his wounds, from, yes, the piercings, from the crown of thorns, from the beating to his face, the beating to his back, as his blood just dripped from his body. It says in Psalm 22, in Jesus, there in, in prophecy, all my bones are out of joint. This was the goal of those who would crucify another one. We know in crucifixion, the one being executed faced asphyxiation. The arms and the legs would be utilized to help someone draw their breath. In order to inflict as much pain as possible in this process, the one crucified, perhaps while the cross was being dropped into place, had their arms and legs and pelvic bones completely pulled out of joint. And so the Lord Jesus, all my bones are out of joint. It says in Psalm 22, my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. That physical beating heart of Jesus struggling to keep up with all of the stress. When he died, the soldier pierced his side, and as it came up through his side into his heart, it punctured his heart, resulting in water and blood flowing out. I'm told that prolonged, intense agony produces a colorless secretion within the perigardium which envelops the heart. That was what was pierced by the spear, and that's why what gushed out was blood and water. Jesus said in Psalm 22, my strength is dried up, utter exhaustion. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. You remember the words in the New Testament of Jesus on the cross, I thirst. He says in Psalm 22, they pierced my hands and my feet. Oh, what pain as the nerves would feel that steel penetrating the skin and down through the hands. Finally, he says, I, te- I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. In one further humiliation, the one being crucified was stripped naked. We can look at the price that was paid and we can understand there was great intense physical suffering on the part of Jesus Christ and what he endured in a crucifixion. But I think that we all are well aware with the scripture to realize the greatest suffering was not, those physical su- was not the physical suffering. All that he endured on the physical side was nothing to be compared with what he endured spiritually. That was the greatest agony. That's why he cried out, and those words were recorded in the Old Testament, repeated by Jesus in the New Testament, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 2 Corinthians 5.21, he was made sin for us who knew no sin. Galatians 3 puts it this way, he was made a curse for us, forsaken, forsaken by the Father, the only time in all of eternity, past, present, or future, that there would be a rift in that trinity was while Jesus was on the cross. We're told in Habakkuk 1 verse 13 of the Lord, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. And that is why the Father turned his back on the Son. Oh, what a price was paid that we might be redeemed. We're bought with a price. Charles Spurgeon speaks of the glorification of Jesus Christ in this payment for our sins. He says, the Lord Jesus is everything in redemption. He's the buyer, and he's also the price. And he suffered for us. There's a third thing I'd have us to note. The fact that ye are bought with a price. And it's not just the people, not just the price. But something that's implied is the passion. Why would the Lord of all, the great I am, concern himself with the redemption of ones 
who are but dust. And why would he feel any bit of sympathy for those who had sinned against him, rebelling against his authority, turning from his way, disdaining his goodness? All that we face as sinners, our bondage, the penalty for our crimes against him, is it not fully deserved? Why redeem those who are but dust and so deeply depraved? And then to consider the price that would have to be paid to redeem us. Why would he suffer so much for his creation, for rebels, and traitors, for sinners such as I? We know the words of Romans 5, 6 through 8. When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we had no strength, entirely helpless to save ourselves, when no one else would have lifted a finger to help, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I've illustrated this many ways in the past. But again, you ask somebody, would you be willing to die for another who is innocent? If you know they were wrongly accused, if you know that they had not done the crimes and they were facing execution, would you take their place? And most would say, well, I don't think, I don't know that I could do that. Maybe if it was family, maybe if it was a friend, I could die in their place. Well, what if it was one who was sentenced to die who was guilty? One who was sentenced to die who deserved the death penalty, either by murder, by some gruesome crime, by some high treasonous act? Would you be willing to die in their place? And people would tell me all the time, no, I wouldn't die for someone like that. They deserve what they're getting. And so it is for you and I. Why would Jesus die for me? I deserve the pit of hell. That's what I should get. Why would God die for a sinner? The simple answer, John 3.16, God so loved the world. He so loved the world. Wow. Wow. How? Why? That's why we sing the hymn, Amazing Love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And there's someone out there today that's questioning how God could be a God of love and power and yet permit the coronavirus. I've, I've read it. If God's a God of love, then why doesn't he do something about this pandemic? Some may be wondering if God loves them because of a lost job and inability to get back to work and saying, does God really love me? Maybe something else will arise in your life and you'll find yourself in a situation surrounded by challenges, overwhelmed by trials with no light at the end of the tunnel. Perhaps then the question will be posed to you, does God really love me? Well, let's answer that question once and for all. Yes. God loves you. Christ's death on the cross, His payment for our sin, His redemption settles that debate forever. Does God love me? Does God care for me? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, He does. He demonstrated it in the greatest act of love possible. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, redeeming us from the curse of the law, setting us free so that we could have everlasting life. He loved us in all our sin. If he loved us enough to pay such a price, how deep is his love for us? There's a song that was written a few years ago. It's been sung here in our church a few times. I love the words. It says in the chorus, If you never speak another word of blessing, if you never speak another word of blessing, God, and your silence leaves me with a sense of loss, I'll remember when my heart begins to question any doubt that you love me. It was settled at the cross. Yes, God loves me. And Jesus Christ's death on the cross and the price that he paid to purchase us from the slave, the 
the slavery and the bondage to sin demonstrates His love beyond anything that we could even fathom He loves us. Consider then a fourth thing in this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We've seen the people that were purchased by that price and the passion that was present in paying that price for our sins. Consider thou number four, the possession. The possessed people. We are the possession now of God. Being redeemed changes everything. Notice again what the word said at the end of verse number 19. It says, ye are not your own. I'm wearing this morning a ring on my left hand, on my ring finger. What does it say? It sends a message. I belong to somebody. I belong to my wife. I remember the day that she put that ring on my finger, a symbol of her love, and I was at that moment her husband. I belong to her. The Lord likewise has laid claim to us. If we've been saved, if we're redeemed, when we read of the Lord's jealousy and the Word of God, it's this reality in view. We're His. We don't belong to anyone else. We belong to Him. And since we belong to Him, oh, what privilege that affords us. Think about it in these terms. Being possessed by God as His servant, nothing can happen to me apart from His allowances. I'm His. When Satan desired to attack Job, he had to get permission from God first. He couldn't just do what he wanted. Job belonged to God. In fact, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Again, the words, have you considered my servant? He belongs to me. He's mine. Satan, you can't touch him without my permission. He's mine. Oh, what a privilege. What a privilege that we're called his sheep. What are the privileges of those to whom, the, the, to whom uh, they, when they belong, when one belongs to the good shepherd. What are their privileges? We read about it in Psalm 23. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He's going to lead me in beside the still waters and in the paths of righteousness. And when I fall over, He's going to restore me. And even when I walk through those perilous times, the valley of the shadow of death, I won't have to fear because He's with me and His rod and staff. He'll comfort me. And then He's going to prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. What a privilege. We belong to the good shepherd. What does it mean that we discover in Scripture that we're his children? What are the privileges of being his child? What are the privileges of being able to say, Abba, Father, of calling him Daddy? Well, we're heirs. We're heirs of the kingdom of heaven. If ye then being evil, the Bible says, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? What a privilege that He's my Father and the things that He gives me will be good. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, the children of God. What love. What a privilege to be loved of God in this way. It says, ye are of God little children and have overcome them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Oh, what privilege is to be his children, to be his sheep, to be his servants. What privilege to be his ambassadors. The Old Testament, the foreign king afflicted the ambassadors of Israel, publicly humiliated them and shamed them. David, to whom the ambassadors belong, said, these heathen have offended me. When they shamefully treated the ambassadors, They despised the king, and the king arose with his armies and dismantled the enemy. The privilege of being an ambassador to the king of kings is that when someone comes after us, they've come after him. And he will arise, and he will make things right. You know, in the current health crisis, think of what this means. The Lord bought you at such a high price. Now you belong to him. If we are His, and not even Satan can touch us without the Lord's allowances, what do we have to fear from this disease? We belong to Him. Will He not care for us? I'm not saying be careless. To the contrary, this is no longer my body. It's His. So I should practice care for the temple of God. But having practiced wise care, there should be no fear. I'm His. I belong to Him. What privilege. As we look at these who 
who are now possessed, there's not only privilege, there's another side to that. Being possessed by him, when you read the words, ye are not your own, there's responsibility in that. In those same relationships, in the servant, because I belong to him. Now I'm under my master's care, and he is the one who will provide for me. Well, you know what? There's also a responsibility. And what's the responsibility of the servant to the master? We read it. Servants, obey your masters in all things. My responsibility is obedience. What about in that relationship as a sheep? What is my responsibility in all this care that he provides and the privileges of the sheep? What is the responsibility of a sheep? We read it in John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. It's to be hearing his voice, to be attentive and to be following. That's what a sheep should do, to let him lead, to let him guide. What are the responsibilities that comes as a child? Hey, we teach our children the responsibility, right? Hey, son. Hey, honey. Honor thy father. Honor thy father. What's the responsibility of me to my heavenly father? To honor him in all things. To see that his name is exalted. There was a day when I had just got my license. And when you just get your license, you like to drive. I've told you the story before. On one occasion, I was driving to go pick, to put some gas in the car, my dad's car. And uh, I got a little careless. I was going a little fast. I there's oncoming traffic. I turned, didn't see another car coming out. And as I pulled in the gas station, the gas pump jumped right out in front of me and I hit it. When I hit the gas pump, oh, I knew I was in big trouble. I didn't hit it real hard, but there was a nice big dent in that pump. And I remember when the attendant came out, because he had seen the whole thing, I went inside and I'm giving him my information. And I handed him my license, and I handed him the insurance. And he saw my name, Gritton. Is your dad the pastor over there at Calvary Baptist? And my heart sank. <laughs> oh, he knows my dad. What did this do to my dad's name? I wanted my dad to be honored. And it just killed me to think that because of what I had done, now someone might not view my dad in the same way. By the way, it was my dad's name that got me out of trouble. I didn't pay a dime. My insurance, nothing. They just let it go because they knew my father. Oh, how good it is, again, to belong to the heavenly father and what he does for us. But, you know, we want to honor our father. We want his name to be lifted up. Even as we pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May others glorify your name. May others look up to you. May you be exalted. Oh, the responsibilities that come as a child. Honor your father. Is the way you're living honoring your father? What are the responsibilities that come as an ambassador? An ambassador is sent out to faithfully represent the king and the kingdom from which he is sent and fulfill a commission. So it is for us. We've got responsibilities. Now then we are ambassadors of Christ. Think about that. Sent out to go and to carry his kingdom and those things that are in his kingdom's interest and that commission that he's given us to this foreign land in which we live. And so this possession that we look at in verse number 19 then leads into the practice of verse number 20. And that's the final thought here this morning. For we are bought with a price, therefore, you're not your own. You're bought with a price, therefore, there's something that flows out of this. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You're bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself. Glorify God. Glorify God. You know, this tells us something of our master. First of all, we see he has purchased us with his own blood, paying the highest price, infinitely greater than what we could even fathom, and yet our allegiance, our service, is not forced. Rather, he leaves it to us, to our will, and to our choice. Again, he's not telling us that we're going to be simple robots. Rather, he's calling us. He's pleading with us, glorify God. The one who's bought you, the one to whom you belong, glorify him. Notice again in verse number 20, it says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Focus first of all on that thought. Glorify God in your spirit. The Lord's not looking 
merely for an outward show or a, a dead formalism. He desires that within, in our spirit, we glorify Him. And that's why we see that in the Bible's prescription for giving. What are we told? We're not told to give grudgingly or of necessity. Don't give with the wrong spirit. Rather give cheerfully, for the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. I get to be part of God's work in giving. God can do so much more with this than what I could. Honor God in your spirit. But the real context of these verses emphasizes not the spirit, but the body. In fact, look back at simple verse, verse number 18. What does it say? Flee fornication. Flee sexual sins. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. By the way, there is a lie today that sin is sin, all sin's the same. There's no one sin that's greater than another sin. Look, it's true that any sin could send you to hell, but it is not true that all sin is equal. In fact, Jesus Christ himself looked at Pilate and he said, he that delivered me has committed what? The greater sin. In this verse, in verse number 18, we find that there's a difference in sins as well. And that sexual sins impact us in a deeper way. In verse 18, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that, uh, that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. But you'll notice that's the context. When he tells them in verse number 19 and 20, what? Know ye not? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Corinthians were caught up in something where they believe that as long as they're right on the inside, they can do what they want on the outside. By the way, that shows what you do on the outside, if it's wrong, is showing what's on the inside is also wrong. It's not possible to have a heart right with God and at the same time be doing something that is sinful. But they thought that you could separate the two. That's not possible. We look at verse number 19 in our body being the temple of the Holy Ghost. We often look at this verse from the angle of taking care of the body. It's not my body. It's God's body. So I should live in such a way that is healthy and cares for. When I was growing up, this was the verse that they was always used when they would tell us as, as young people, don't start smoking because smoking is not healthy. And so that's true. I shouldn't because it affects the temple of the Holy Ghost. I should live a healthy lifestyle. But again, the more direct context goes beyond that. And it's that I would not yield myself to sin. That it's not just about keeping my body healthy, but that what I do with my body is holy and pure in the sight of God. Romans chapter 6 addresses this same reality more broadly. It says, ye were the servants of sin. We saw that earlier. But being made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So then, do not yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So the thought is this, I've got members to my body, my hands, my tongue, my mind, my feet, all of my body. How can I allow my body, which belongs to God, which is not mine, how can I allow it to be used to serve sin? How can I allow my tongue to be used in a bla to blaspheme God's name? How can I allow my tongue to be used in cursing or gossip or lying or tearing others down? My tongue rather should be used for edifying, for building up, for speaking truth and love, for being an encourager. My hands, my hands are not my own. These are God's hands. No longer allow my hands to be a taker or a striker or join hands with the wicked, but now I yield them to the Lord as a giver, as a comforter, as a helper, a burden bearer, joining hands with the righteous. My feet are God's. No longer walking in the ways of the wicked, but now walking in the footsteps of Christ. No longer walking in the flesh, but now walking in the spirit. And you get the picture. This is what is being described in 1 Corinthians 6. Look, he paid such a price for you. This body is not your own. Don't use it for yourself. Don't, don't just gratify the flesh. How can we allow what belongs to God to be used for sin? This body is his temple and should be dedicated to his service. 
One of the most startling histories in all of the Bible is what happened the night that Babylon fell. Belshazzar, the son of the king and the co-regent, felt secure within the walls of the city as the enemy armies of the Medes and Persians gathered outside. He was so safe in his mind, he threw an elaborate party, a drunken feast. He had no fear of God. He had disregarded the light that had been given to him about the true God, and that night his crimes against heaven reached their climax. What did he do? Well, we read about it in Daniel chapter number 5. Belshazzar took the vessels of gold and silver, those vessels that had been dedicated to the Lord, used in the temple in Jerusalem, those vessels that when Nebuchadnezzar had come through and taken the children of Israel captive, they had confiscated all those silver and gold vessels. I don't know if they had put them in a trophy case or something similar in Babylon, but all those vessels, which were meant solely for the worship of God, that night, Belshazzar called for those, brought them in, and profaned them, and used them in his wicked, drunken party. That night, the handwriting on the wall came, literally. The finger of God appeared and spelled out Belshazzar's judgment. That night, the empire fell. Belshazzar woke up in hell. May I remind you again of the seriousness of his sin? He took what was dedicated to the Lord, the things that belonged to the temple of God, and he used them to do that which was profane. And it's the same thing that every Christian is guilty of when we take this body that belongs to God and we allow it to be used in that which is profane. It's no small thing when we yield ourselves to sin. Know ye not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Are you involved in something that dishonors your father? Are you involved in some sin? Maybe it's of the mind. Maybe it's of what comes in through the eye gate. Maybe it's with your tongue. Maybe it's in the way that you're conducting and walking your life. You know what? Christian, it's time we repent. It's time we look back at these truths and say, The Lord bought me with a price. How can I not glorify him? with this life that he redeemed at such a price? And how can we not allow ourselves then to be used in a way that glorifies God, taking that tongue which in the past had cursed and now using that tongue to praise, taking that that hand that had been used to smite and now to be a blessing to others, taking that mind which was full of vain thoughts and now filling it with the word of God. Oh, that we would come to dedicate our lives. Here's the whole principle of that simple consecration in the Christian life, and that's this. I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price, so I glorify God. I wonder, as you watch this sermon, as you study these words, if the Lord is speaking to your heart. Child of God, if the Lord has revealed something in your life, confess it, forsake it. And dedicate your life to the Lord. Lord, this is your body. I will not continue in this sin. Lord, this is your mind. I will not allow my thoughts to be plagued with fear or worry. Father, I'm going to allow my thoughts to be focused on you and allow that peace to come in and honor you. The way that I think, the things that I say, and what I listen to, and what I see, and and even how I appear to others, I, I want the joy of the Lord to be seen in me. Oh, that today, as a child of God, we would understand we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. Maybe you're present with us by video. We've heard all these truths. Christ died. He paid that price to redeem those who were defiled. I wonder, have you been redeemed? Are you saved? The Bible tells us that though Christ's death is sufficient for all, for The Bible says He was the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. That His payment is only efficient or only applied to those who will repent 
and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need that transfer of kingdoms. It was the thief on the cross who died beside Jesus Christ in his final moments. In his life, where he saw himself as a guilty sinner before God, he knew the just penalty of his sins and what he was facing if he were to stand before God. But in his repentant spirit and heart, he looked at Jesus Christ and he made this simple request, full of faith, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Let me be a part of your kingdom. That was his request. Jesus, your Lord, you have the grace and the mercy that I need. And Jesus gave him a promise. He said, truly, verily I say unto thee, today you will be with me in paradise. Salvation was granted, liberated from the penalty of his sin of suffering in hell, liberty, liberating from that, that power of sin. And ultimately, when he died that day from the presence of sin, all of that redemption granted to that, to that thief dying in those moments. And so it is for you. If you know today that you're a sinner and you want to be saved, call out to the Lord Jesus Christ that repentant heart and in faith, Lord, save me, save me. I know I can't save myself. I agree with you. I am defiled. I cannot change my sinful past. I cannot change and stop sinning now. I cannot take away the penalty, the power, the presence of sin. It's only you that can save. Save me, change me, transform me. Call on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do it today. Know the joy, know the privilege, and even the responsibilities of belonging to a new master, being bought with a price. Oh, what a wonderful truth. Bought with a price. May those of us who have enjoyed such redemption live it out every day. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today, and I thank you for the privilege of standing here, being able to sing, Redeemed. A done deal, Lord, that you have brought us out of that bondage to sin. Lord, that you have made us a child of the King. Lord, we serve a new master. We wear your name. Lord, what a joy that is. Father, may these truths penetrate our hearts that we would live in such a way that we glorify you in all that we do, in our body and in our spirit, for they are yours. Lord, if there is one listening that is not saved, oh, Lord, today, would you help them? Would you bring conviction of sin, Father? Would you give them that understanding? May they see that it's not by being baptized or joining a church. Father, help them to see it's by faith and calling out and receiving the gift of eternal life. Oh, Lord, I pray today, help them, wherever they may be, to have that faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, today we pray that you'd be honored and glorified in all things on this Palm Sunday, this Lord's Day. Lord, may our mind be full of gratitude and thanksgiving to you in all that you've done for us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>